We're going to talking about securing microservices. Now, uh, this is the first time I've given this talk. So that's, I'm not just trying to apologize in advance for it not being very good. Uh, I'm fairly sure the ideas are okay. We're going to find out delivery-wise how this goes, but you are, this, is, this is the premiere of this talk. Uh, as such, I feel it does need to be classed as being beta. Um, what that means is that I can, if it's terrible, I can then claim to be pivoting towards a better talk. Um, but I do like your feedback. Um, if you don't let me know on Twitter or in person, uh, if there's anything else I'd like to cover. It's actually a really large topic. And the problem is that I think the general awareness level of security and security issues varies drastically. Uh, and I think there's a lot of developers who historically have seen security as being somebody else's problem. Like I think you go back say 10 years, it was somebody else that made sure your application actually worked, right? Developers, we wrote code, and then somebody else would go and manually click and make sure it actually works. And then we've got used to the fact that we have to do automated testing. We used to have specialist DBAs to do simple things like just create a table. Now we know as developers, we should do that. I think we're on a journey towards that around security. So I have, have got some stuff in here which is really trying to frame the general problem of what security is for the application developer, and also talking about the challenges and opportunities that come from applying those models in the context of microservices themselves. Um, but this is a work in progress. I really do want your feedback on, um, on other topics you'd like to see, the different emphases that I'd like to see. Um, I work for a company called ThoughtWorks. We have four offices in Germany. We're in Cologne, Berlin. We're in... Lukash, help me out. Hamburg. Hamburg and Munich, where the beer comes from. Um, I'm actually doing a talk in our offices on Thursday, a different talk. If you want to come along, there should be tweets about it at some point. But our virtual app, uh, I'll be doing a talk there. Uh, we're always hiring. If you're interested in a job, come talk to us. InnoQ are also a lovely company, and they're very nice people. But you won't find this for my company. Anyway, uh, I also did a book. Now, they've given you beer. So like maybe half of you applies to them and half we'll work out a deal later. Um, what about me? Uh, so we'll, we'll go 33% 30, each. We'll be fine. Um, I did a write a book on microservices um, last year. It came out at the beginning of the year. Um, so a lot of the stuff, some of the stuff I'm going to talk to you about today has come from the book from a security point of view. Um, but I've spent a lot more time looking into those issues subsequently. But this book goes quite broad around a bunch of stuff. I do need to start off, though, with a bit of Q&A. It's always a nice thing to do, get people a bit active, get people a bit involved. So I'm going to ask you a very simple question. Hands up, who is a doctor here? Anyone a doctor? A medical doctor, Tom? Right. Oh, yeah, you would be, wouldn't you? Okay, so none of you are a medical doctor. Okay, are any of you diagnosed virologists, biologists, has an in-depth working... Uh, wrong doctor. Doctor has an in-depth working of how microbes or bacteria works, any of... Okay, yeah, Tom does know. Okay, um, you don't know this stuff. You are not medical doctors. You're not experts. You haven't gone to university for seven years and spent time cutting up cadavers or looking at stuff in petri... Well, some of you may have, but if what you do in your spare time. But the you're not necessarily medical doctors, and yet you understand the importance of washing your hands, right? You do. You know, we understand that we have a part to play in stopping the spread of diseases and stopping ourselves from getting unwell by washing our hands. We don't understand all the detail, but we at least know that this is a good idea. I think where we are with security as a profession is that we've decided I'm not a security expert and therefore I'm going to abdicate all responsibility for security for somebody else. It's going to be somebody else's problem. And I don't think that really makes any sense anymore. I think there's a bunch of stuff that we need to become aware of. We don't necessarily need to be able to write our own cryptography algorithms, and please don't do that. Uh, really, it's only going to end badly. If you've got a PhD, maybe you're allowed to write uh, your own cryptography libraries. But there's a base level of stuff that we can do as a profession that will make our systems more secure and therefore will make our customers more secure. This is achievable, this is possible. I'm hoping today that you'll get some of those ideas 
Because all of us should have that, that base level of understanding, even if it only gets to the point of, I'm a doctor in as much as I know that washing my hands is a good idea. There are always going to be spaces for specialists. But you don't all have to be specialists. So of course this is a talk about security, so I have to scare you. That's how this all works. The whole security profession is about scaring you about the bad things that can happen. And um, now I'm going to try, let's see if the internet is being my friend today. Um, I have got a video if this doesn't actually work. And some of you may have seen this before. So this is a fun map. So um, this is an organization called Norse and they track in real time various attacks that are happening on systems. Oh, it's not loading the world map. There we go. So what you're seeing right now are basically things like denial of service attacks, telnet overflows, people trying to overload in the ping socket. And at different times of day, you see different attacks from different locations. When I, I did a screen cap of this last night, and any Brazilians in the house? Where's Phil? There was Brazil was unleashing hell on parts of Sierra Leone yesterday. And a lot of these were botnets, compromised botnets. It's really interesting when you watch this stuff. A lot of this, this is like, this is often the most common attack vector. Good old fashioned telnet. This is a very, very quiet day. Um, so if I go back to, I better shut that down because it does drain my uh, battery quite badly. Um, but if I go back to the presentation, I can show you what I captured yesterday. It's always fun watching this stuff. Oh, goodness me. Um, so you can go take a look at any time of day, map.norse.com. And this is the screen cap I captured. Uh, this stuff is just happening. It's just a background effect. If you're on the public internet, at a certain point, you're going to get port scanned, you're going to get hit. Um, somebody, I, I've had sites taken down by people doing very innocent things. Yeah, right. This is Brazil, <laughs> right? This is Brazil right now, and they are they, these guys not happy, not happy at all. Um, and so you can actually see where they're coming from. This looks like a, tr a classic botnet where people have basically got a whole load of drones and they're using unleashing a denial of service attack. The the really funny thing is, a large amount of these attacks are actually very easy to block by just doing basic stuff like patching of machines, turning off ports you don't need, just to immediately limits the attack surface area. This is all, if you need to encourage people to invest in security at your own company, pop that up and it, and it scares the wits out of, your, out of your CTOs and they go, yes, money for security, it's always fun. Um, but we still do have this mindset, which is that you know we have like our build pipelines um, and with our build pipelines, we got used to the idea that we used what we used to do was we used to do like three months of development, and then we'd do three months of testing, and and then realised we had to go back to development. And we thought it was a bad idea, so we started breaking up testing, pulling it into the delivery process. So every time we check in, we'd run some tests, and yet security is still that thing we do at the end. Just before security, just before production, maybe we have someone take a look at the source code and go, oh, uh, maybe we should check it. Once it's in prod, we'll get a pen test done. Now, I actually think penetration testing of applications is sort of an incredibly sensible idea. I think there's a lot of value in getting outside organizations that specialize in penetration testing, who come at your systems with an attacker mentality to really validate your systems. I absolutely, you know, I mean, Part of my day job is um, I look after ThoughtWorks internal systems. I'm the architect for those. We have pen tests every three to six months of our entire corporate networks. They're incredibly valuable. Do that stuff, but there's also value in pulling security a bit earlier in your thinking process. Not relying until you get to production, but bringing it even into your thinking on the laptop. Oddly, Microsoft has some really good stuff about incorporating security type thinking into your delivery process. Uh, the first cuts of this were a little bit waterfall, um, but they've got new versions that work with agile processes. But it is, I mean, legitimately, this is really good information and excellent stuff that's worth looking at if you want to pull a bit of security thinking into this space. Before we go into specifics, I want to give you a little bit of a model to think about because I think when we think about security, often we're very focused on one thing 
which is let's not ba let a bad thing happen. And we focus all of our energy on that one thing. But if you only focus in prevention, you're going to be screwed when the inevitable happens and something bad happens. And so we've kind of developed a model that we use internally, we use with our clients. We're not a security software consultancy. We don't claim to be detailed experts, but what we're trying to do is bring that security thinking into our delivery processes. And the model we like to use is sort of a four-step model. We think about, firstly, the important stuff, prevention. How do you stop a bad thing from happening in the first place? If a bad thing does happen, the next thing to think about is detection. Do you know if it's happened? So you just patched your machine for an exploit that came out. That's great. So you know you're now going to prevent the exploit happening in the future. But has somebody used that vector to attack your system? Do you even know? Once you've detected something, it's like, what is your response? How do you react to that problem? And finally, once you know whether you react to that problem, there's like, how do you recover if the bad thing has happened? And you don't necessarily need to spend to split your security budget into these four buckets, but you do need to think holistically about this model. If you put all of your eggs in this basket and someone gets through and you've got no understanding about how to pick up if a problem has happened, let your customers know or recover from that situation, it's still going to be a bad thing. So let's dive in first. Let's think a little bit about prevention. What sort of things we think about, specifically in the context of a microservice-oriented system, around prevention. Um, so one of the benefits of being a consultant, I've been with ThoughtWorks for about 12 years, is I get to work at lots of different companies. I've sort of had one job for 12 years or like 50 jobs for 12 years. And you get to see different organizations that have you know, different profiles around risk and everything else. One of the organizations I was working with was just starting to get more savvy around security. And one of the internal risk people said, you know what we need? We need to have put some CCTV cameras on our front door so that we know who's coming into our building. So I think bad happens, we get an idea about what happened. And this particular organization, everybody goes, they're all quite privacy sensitive. And it's like, well, no, I don't, why are you doing that? Why are you filming me? Do you not trust me? And so there's this big, long conversation about privacy and it's your security people. You're coming and looking at my, you know, looking at what I'm doing. And then one person said, okay, so you want to put a CCTV camera on our front door to know who comes in and out to help deal with a problem if it happens or know what's who's coming to our premises. Maybe, should we maybe make sure that the door locks first? Because this building, the door locks, but it hadn't locked properly for two years. Right. And when you start getting into the world, especially around prevention, you see people who see a potential where a problem could occur and you think, right, I've got to deal with that problem right now. But they never actually step back and look holistically at this problem. In this particular situation, do I spend $5,000 on a CCTV camera and a retention policy around the video and set it up in a room somewhere and have policies around that and soothe you know, the angst of people around privacy? Or do I spend $100 and have a locksmith make sure my door closes? Right. In that particular situation, it's quite easy to see where you're going to get the best bang for your buck. But when it comes to prevention, having some model to allow you to look holistically at the problems you're, you could have and know where to spend your time is important. Uh, Bruce Schneier is always worth reading on the, com on the topic of application security. Uh, he did a paper years ago for Dr. Dobbs that he's now got online that talks about one model that can be very effective for what's called sort of threat modeling. And that's using a concept of attack trees. And so with attack trees, what you do is you're, you're putting yourself in the mind of the attacker, the person who is trying to get I some information out of your system, get access to your system. And the example he uses in his article is this idea that there's a goal that an attacker is trying to, to achieve, which is to open my safe. I need to get into my safe. Okay, so how, what are the ways in which I can get hold of your safe? Okay, I could pick the lock, right? Or, you know, do the tumblers with a little earpiece, right? I could learn the combination. I could cut it open. I could pick a big drill in. Okay. Uh, when you actually think about learning the combination, there's other ways you could get hold of that. So, well, how could I learn the combination? I could find it written down somewhere. Okay, I could do that. I could get the combination from the target. This is where it gets all very, like, thriller-like, and it's all, like, it's, like, 
it's, yeah, how can I do that? I could blackmail them, I could threaten them, I could bribe them. When you're doing threat modeling around your systems, you do actually need to think about this. You know, if you're a, an organization that has very sensitive data that outside attackers will want, what have you done to ensure that people aren't put in a situation where this could even happen? So anyway, this is the idea. You, you think about the, 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 saw, the thing they're trying to get. You start thinking about the paths they could use to achieve that. So in our previous example, you know, going in through the front door turns out to be very easy if your front door doesn't lock, right? But then you can attach weight to these. So you can attack maybe monetary value. Maybe it's just a, a number from 1 to 10 about how easy or how hard something is. Uh, I mean the very I initial example he gives is saying it's either possible or impossible. So, you know, cutting it open, yeah, that's possible. Um, you know, picking the lock is impossible because actually we spent a lot of money on a very, very expensive safe. It's not really something that anyone's ever cracked. Uh, it's quite possible to bribe somebody or something, and you can start thinking and attaching weights, and it allows you to think rationally about what actually are the attack vectors that are viable. And this then gives you a framing when you're looking at prevention to say, where do we spend our time? Where do we spend our energy? Um, probably, as many of you will know, this is kind of an interesting one. Large numbers of hacks have been done via social means. People walking around looking at post-it notes on people's desks, phoning them up, pretending to be other people, dumpster diving. Uh, Larry Ellison um, has famously admitted to sending private investigators to legally dumpster dive Microsoft to get trade secrets, for example. When you put it out on the street, you've given up your ownership to this. So thinking rationally about threat modeling is a good start. Where is the most likely source of an attack? Let's think of a fake example. Here we've got, uh, I use a fake domain of, the, of a music shop as a way of talking about the idea of microservices. And so here's like an example architecture from the point of view of a microservice-oriented world. When we're thinking about attack vectors, one of the things where, where microservices increase the surface area of attack is actually around transport security. With a monolithic system, m you know, you've got a large amount of functionality within a single process boundary. You have calls coming into it. Your surface area of networks is more limited. With a microservice architecture, a lot of what would be in-process calls protected within that boundary are now distributed potentially across machines. Now, on the one hand, that makes you, you've got more surface area where information can be sniffed on the other hand, it gives us a lot more options about how to protect our application. And as always, microservices are a bit of a double-edged sword. They give us all these great stuff and all this downside as well. So let's talk about transport security. How might I go about protecting this organization? Well, let's start with default stuff. So this stuff here, these are my internal services. This is my network perimeter. So what would be a good default approach to preventing bad stuff happening to my network? Increasingly, people are just using this default. They just say, we're just going to assume that within our network perimeter, things are maybe just HTTPS. Um, you know, five years ago, you have a lot of concerns around the overhead of HTTPS traffic, but the way processes have gone, and um, it's less of a concern now. So this is great. So what we're going to do is just to say that within our organizational perimeter, maybe that's a good default, right? But what does HTTPS actually give us? in the context of a services talking to each other within our network perimeter. We get server guarantees, as in assuming I've actually used properly signed certificates, then at least as a client, I know when I talk to invoice.mycompany.com that it really is the server it claims to be. And I can validate that. That, el that eliminates the possibility that somebody, as I've got hold of my certificate, is pretending to be somebody else to get information. It also gives me some guarantees that my payload has not been manipulated, which is, again, a useful thing. So I know that, the, that I've had some protection that I've eliminated man-in-the-middle attacks. Although it does turn out that it's not that simple because you do need to know how to write good, you know, create decent certificates. There's one thing to note, though, that there's no client guarantees. This gives certainty, this gives a warm, fuzzy feeling if you're a client. If you're the server, 
you still don't know who the client is in that particular situation. So HTTPS doesn't solve all of these sorts of problems. Also, hands up who thinks that certificates are easy to work with. We have one person, two people, okay. They're not, it's very easy to get wrong. And actually, it used to be a giant problem. It still is, but I think there's some stuff that might be changing it. But nonetheless, maybe as a very, if you can automate that problem, you get a level of security for a very low cost, but also within your network perimeter, you assume you've got some additional levels of protection. Now, certificates are a pain. You have to go to certificate authorities. Some organizations like self serving certificates internally, but that becomes problematic and can introduce security holes because suddenly you just, everybody blindly accepts that anything that self sign is okay, and then you've effectively given up one of your major protections. How many people here have heard of Let's Encrypt? That's really awesome. I'm in Germany. You're way more security conscious than most places I go in the world. So I just want to say, um, where this is 18 years over, Let's Encrypt is fucking awesome, right? The normal process around getting certificates is problematic. On the firstly, you have to pay money. It's not really a big deal. It's like 35 bucks. The biggest problem is there's no easy way to automate that process. So if you're in an environment where you are provisioning machines and services dynamically, where you're significantly more likely to be in a microservices world where we look more about provisioning machines, provisioning services in a more dynamic fashion with the more monolithic systems, if you're looking to standardize on something like HTTPS, the lack of automation is really painful. Let's Encrypt is doing two things. Firstly, it's free. I would actually pay large amounts of money for this service because of this. It is automated. The command line to get a certificate is uh, sort of that. That talks to the certificate authority. It creates a certificate for your domain and it puts it in a local directory. There's a one-liner <coughs> to configure your Apache or Nginx certificate. That will take the certificate and set up Apache or Nginx for HTTPS using that certificate. One line, done, the whole thing. Want to renew a certificate? I Let's encrypt renew. Just works. This is insanely useful, awesome stuff. And did I mention it's free? It's currently in beta right now. Um, they've been issuing certificates already, not fully signed. They are going to be a root um, question. Uh, I would suggest diving into the docs. There's some very, very good, clear documentation. I would, I think I know, but I don't want to say because I don't want to get that stuff wrong. This is where I'm the whole. I am not a security person. I just play one on TV. Thing comes in. Um, uh, so that you'll have to check. You have to check. Um, the uh, it's there's an underlying protocol they've defined for this called the Acme protocol. They so they've initially started defining that protocol around the automation piece, and they're hoping that other signatories will also pick that up as well. So there is actually I can't remember who the people are behind this. Oh, it's the Linux Foundation collaborative projects. Anyway, um, their first goal was actually just to make HTTPS the lower the barrier to entry for this stuff. I suspect you'll start seeing the command flow here used by other signatories out there. <laughs> there are other things they do. One of the things they don't do, they have more limited certificate support, they don't support wildcard certificates because they say it's so easy to issue a certificate like this, why would you have wildcards anymore? Um, so yeah, do go look, it's very well written. Um, now, that's great, okay, so that's server-side guarantees. What if I want client-side guarantees? Well, maybe I can have some client-side certificates, right? Uh, client side certificates where the client now has a certificate running locally, the server can authenticate that yes, you are who you say you are. This is sometimes a useful thing to do. You know what? If you thought server side certificates were a pain, client side certificates are a giant pain. As a result, I have yet to meet an organization that has done it well. I've seen many organizations that have started that process but given up because of the cost of automation. But this is the sorts of things you might like to do. Now, actually, very recently, um, Netflix released their Lima project, which is basically their attempt to simplify PKI infrastructure, which should simplify client certificate issuing. I have not used it in anger. I do not know. But if I'm thinking about my fake domain, here I've got some my music web shops talking to an, a third-party royalty service. This is an external dependency that I might have. 
I might be very sensitive about the information being sent. Even with all the effort and pain around managing my client certificates, in this particular situation, maybe I'm going to make that decision. And this is the, this is the issue. With a more monolithic system, you tend to get to make one choice around a lot of your transport security. Here we get lots of options. HTTPS is sitting here. Here maybe I'm going to use the client certificates where I need to. We could, we should of course talk about authentication and authorization. This stuff gets complicated, especially in the realms of microservices. We can think of the classic stuff. Okay, I've got my mobile app, I've got my web browser. Okay, web browser, I'm using standard form-based. Maybe I've got some, you know, terminating some directory services somewhere. SAML, SAML all the things is something nobody has ever said ever. Um, but nonetheless, this is fine. Mobile apps, I think we're all now familiar with using OAuth or really what most people are using now is OpenID Connect, which being a subset of OAuth 2. So for those of you keeping track, OAuth 1 was a fairly simple way for managing tokens people use for mobile applications. So rather than having to type in your password, you'd get a token issued. If you lost your device, that token could be invalidated. Um, then OAuth 2 came out. OAuth 2, confusingly, is not another new implementation of OAuth 1. It's a giant framework from within which you could pick a subset of an implementation flow to implement a style of OAuth. And the security people wonder why no one does this stuff. Uh, what's actually happened now is OpenID Connect, which is the sort of implementation of OAuth 2 that Twitter and Google use, is emerging. That's very good because it's probably going to replace SAML inside organizations as well. And replacing SAML is a good thing. Um, but this is nice and easy. OK, so I've got the idea that I may use different authentication protocols for different use cases when I'm looking at my perimeter. What can an individual actually do once they come into my world? This is fine, but we have interesting problems in this world, don't we? So I log in, I check ISURSAM. OK, you are allowed to make calls for things for Sam, and I can make calls here. Yes, are you Sam? Yes, I'm Sam. I'm Sam Good, and Sam can do these things. That's a nice world and a world we understand. Where things get interesting is this line here. I talk to the web shop. The web shop, in turn, is talking to some sort of user service. It's issuing calls. What do I do here? Now, I've authenticated as me. I've made sure at this level that I should only be asking for things that I should see. The music web shop then will make calls on my behalf to downstream services. There's a class of problem where you can trick this thing into asking for things it shouldn't be able to ask for. Now let's imagine I'm just using something like client size certificates or API keys. I could validate that what the music user service could say, yes, it really is the music web shop talking to me. And I know it's the music web shop talking to me. But do I then trust the calls that are being made? It said, hello, I am asking for this information on Bob. Does the user service then say, have you really got Bob's permission to ask? This is what is known, this is a class of problem called the confused deputy problem. Turns out it's a really hard problem. It's where you basically trick a person in the middle into asking for information they shouldn't be able to ask for. If within your perimeter you assume implicit trust, in other words, in this world, if the user service just assumes that any calls from the music web shop are okay, you've got a potential attack vector where people can ask for information they shouldn't ask for. Technically speaking, you can solve this with nested SAML assertions. No sane human being has ever implemented that. I met a, an organization in Norway that had tried, and they said, yeah, it's doable, but everyone wanted to kill themselves. So um, it's really hard because they actually had four or five, it's always things to avoid anyway, they had like five chains of calls, and they were trying to nest assertions five level deep into, it's just terrible. Do you know what? We don't actually right now have a good answer to this. I've yet to see anybody solve the confused deputy problem in a microservice environment in a lightweight, manageable way. It remains just a puzzle for me. There are theoretical ways of solving it. I'll be honest and say a lot of organizations don't even do HTTPS internally within their perimeters. We sort of treat this as like the, the goal, you know, the, the main wall, and we just assume no one's ever going to get in. So this is something you might want to think about. Um, OpenID Connect, again, may 
offer a potential way to handle that. You should be able to pass those credentials downstream uh, in a more lightweight way. The biggest issue actually is the lack of good implementations of OpenID Connect as an identity provider. So these are great things about transit. With a microservice system, we have broken things apart. On the one hand, we've got more attack vectors at the network level. On the other hand, we've got more ability to mix and match which technologies we use where. We can, sp we can spend an, a, a, you know, a large amount of effort on a very small part of our system where it's very vulnerable, for example, doing client certificates, and elsewhere maybe just say, oh, HDBS is going to be fine, because we've looked at the vulnerability of the systems, we've looked at the individual services, and we go, the catalog service, if people break in and steal all the data in the catalog service, they'll know which stuff we sell, which is stuff we put on our website anyway, so who cares? Right, on the other hand, you start thinking about your user data, you have to be much more sensitive. This is when we start thinking about things like data at rest. Again, with a more monolithic system, we start trying to pick database technologies that maybe allow us to encrypt individual tables or columns within that schema, which might limit our database options, that might add an overhead. But if you are thinking from a point of view of our services, maybe say, you know what, this thing is where all our really, really sensitive data is. We're just going to, we shrunk the sphere, we've, we've, we've rather than having all our eggs in one basket, we've now just got one egg. We are actually going to spend a lot of time thinking about protecting this individual egg. And so I can say, right, you know what, we're going to encrypt the whole database. We're not even going to worry about it. The whole thing is just encrypted. We have to use a special type of database. We're using maybe a hardware security appliance just to handle the keys for this thing. And that's fine, and the rest of it is okay. This is why I see organizations that use microservices are starting to think about things like segregation models as well. There's no reason necessarily, if you've got a good software-defined network layer, for example, why your very sensitive downstream services couldn't be on different network segments. The idea of there being one perimeter, with a monolithic system, you get one perimeter. So let's say the public net. With a microservice system, you have the ability to, to have multiple perimeters. Um, I studied a bit of medieval history when I was at school, and you see the development of castles over time. The initial castles were just like a mott and bailey. It was a hill with a big house on it and one little wooden palisade. Over time, they realized once they get in the palisade, we're kind of screwed. What's better than that? Two palisades. Now we're putting a moat. Now let's put a third wall in. I mean, some boiling lead and like arrow slots everywhere and you add more layers. And that's what this is about. Good security prevention is going to be about defense in depth. And we've given ourselves a large amount of opportunities to do defense in depth. Um, hands up, who's got a Docker sticker on their laptop? Right, you must have a few. Keep your hands up. Uh, some of those people with Docker stickers on their laptops are even using Docker in production. Um, Docker's very attractive. It's very interesting. People like it in the world of microservices because it's cost effective. It gives us benefits around performance. I do think it's worth talking about because so many organizations using microservices are using it with Docker. A few things. Firstly, um, containers in general are not places to run untrusted code. Okay? So things can and will bust out of containers and get to the host operating system, uh, unless you're using a proper operating system like Solaris. I did say that. It's true. O you know, OpenVZ is pretty good too. Right, LXC, Docker, they are exploits where you can bust out of containers. If you're only running your own code, that's fine. But a lot of people are not. A lot of people are, one of the things they like, developers especially, they like Docker Hub. Look, I can run a one-line command, and I'm now running MongoDB on my Docker. So that's great. Do you find out stuff like this? 30% of the official images in Docker Hub contain serious security problems. These are basically, on Docker Hub, there's the Wild West, and then the stuff that's trusted. Of those, 30% have critical defects and errors from a security point of view. These are the things that are not patched. When you are pulling something from Docker Hub, you have to trust the individual you're pulling it from. And because of the way Docker images work, you have to trust who they've trusted as well. And even then, these things won't necessarily be patched. If you are pulling images, make sure you know who you're pulling from, make sure you know who they are also inheriting from. And when you pull it down, 
please a understand that there's still a potential attack vector. So potentially run this on separate infrastructure than your stuff that's your, your own code or sensitive. And B, you can do simple things like actually running patches on it once you've pulled it down. This is sort of an uncertain world. No one really understands how to solve this. So some people are coming up with good ideas. Um, there's a bunch of stuff in Linux. There's, a, there's about three different models around security modules that work on machines, which are very smart. There's GR Security, App Armor, and SE Linux. All of these gives you ways of defining what are allowable behaviors of an application. And so one of the proposals is that I can pull down an image from Docker. I'll also have another resource where I say, okay, and this is the, this is the definition of what an acceptable MongoDB looks like. That's a bit of a joke, that should be an acceptable MongoDB is one that's been turned off. Like an acceptable Cassandra instance, maybe. Like it should only talk over these ports, it shouldn't touch these files, and then you could actually run that on the Docker host to make sure that nothing bad's happening. But this is very uncertain. So just be aware that when you're pulling something from Docker Hub and running it, you're basically taking just random code off the internet and running it on your production infrastructure. So just be aware of that. I do also, while we're talking about prevention, coming back all the way back to the story I told earlier about locking your front door, patch your stuff, please. We can talk about HTTPS, we can talk about client certificates, we can talk about API gateways, encryption of data at rest, patch your stuff, patch your stuff. It's a really easy thing to do. A surprisingly large number of high profile exploits and data breaches have been down to people not patching vulnerabilities that have been out there for years. Patch it, just do that. Um, run programs that look at your infrastructure and tell you where your machines are not patched. This is very simple belt and braces stuff. This is washing your hands stuff. You do not get to say, oh, I've got a security expert for that. Just um, patch it, please. So we've talked a lot about prevention because actually prevention is interesting it's sexy we get to think like it's oh it's in war games and i'm matthew broderick on my dial up modem and i'm causing nuclear weapons and i've got to stop that and it's great um then of course we get round to detection hopefully you'll stop all attempts at the door but maybe you won't detection actually starts from even knowing that bad things may have happened so what are your sources of information you know, maybe you're just looking at qualities and looking at the top 10 vulnerabilities, but like, you know, if you're a JVM-based platform, do you even know when new JVM patches are coming out? The reason I say it's important is because, let's say hypothetically, like you had something like Shellshock came out, you know that you've got a patch load of your machines, you find out about that, that's great, but you've then been know you've had a system that's had a potential vulnerability for a period of time. Yes, now I can patch the machine, but do I know if someone actually carried out an exploit in that period of time? And that's a big part of what detection is all about. I'd also say that when you're keeping track of the patches that you've got to apply and the CVEs that are out there, again, something a lot of microservice organizations like doing is being more polyglot. When you're more polyglot, that's a lot more stuff to track. That's a lot more potential exploits you have, a lot more things to keep an eye on. So anyway, bad things can happen. What can we do? There are systems out there, like um, mod security will both prevent and detect when bad things are happening. You've got intrusion detection systems like Snort that will sift there and look at odd stuff that's happening on your networks and go, ah, oh, you know what? Bad things are happening. And often we'll run these sorts of systems like on our big crunchy perimeter um, to run all this. And you might have some already ap appliances that are already there. We do need to think, though, again, think in defense in depth. Maybe we need other ways of detecting stuff. Some of these ways of detecting problems are very, very simple. Um, so actually, when Shellshock came along, I mean, this was just after Heartbleed, and so a lot of the organizations I was working with were already fairly, had already just gone through their patching routines. We're thinking, okay, we've got to fix this stuff. But you could actually work out, based on the nature of the vulnerability, you could actually sometimes determine whether or not you'd been exploited by this. Do you know how you can find out? often just your logs, but so few organizations are even doing something as simple as storing their logs in one central place. A security expert could go look at those logs and think, I'm seeing some patterns and behavior here. 
that imply you may have been impacted by shell shock. So the stuff that we like doing, that I talk about a lot in terms of monitoring and logging around microservices, of pulling all of your information into one place to make it accessible, doesn't just help you from a developer point of view or system administrator point of view, it also helps you from a security point of view. So just having the ELK stack lying around, pulling all your information into one place will help you understand it. There are also fun sites out there. Uh, a friend of mine in Australia runs a site called uh, Have I Been Pwned? Um, so you can type in your username or your email address, and he basically pulls in information from like paste bin and stuff, and you can find out if you've been attacked, you know, if your username has been up there. Detection's interesting because there's like knowing a problem happened, knowing you've applied the patch, understanding you lived with that vulnerability for a window. Were we impacted by that? A lot of those systems are, are quite hit and miss their detection rates, but that's like, did I even have the problem? So detection. That's really, you know, that's, that's less sexy, but still quite sexy. Do you know what's not really sexy? No, it's like response, oh, I've got to do something now, something bad happened, I don't want to do it. Let's talk about how not to do response. Like really how not to do, like seriously, just don't do any, well, who's heard of this company? Yeah, Target, I don't know, not really here, they're in, we've got Target in Australia, but a complete different company from Target in the US. Target had probably the second largest data breach in history in terms of numbers of customer records. The Experian breach was larger in terms of number of records, but the information itself wasn't necessarily actionable. This was huge numbers of credit card information that was stolen. Now, this wasn't a classic, I hacked your database type attack and found out that you'd use a really bad salting algorithm for protecting this information. This was something a lot more smart and a lot more insidious. This was a piece of malware that was um, run on the terminals, the electronic point of sale systems in target stores. So that actually it was memory resident, you swiped a card, it captured the information there and then. So this wasn't a data at rest problem, this wasn't a transit problem. You'd already had stuff running in memory. At that point, you're kind of screwed. And then this information was taken off site. Now, a few things happened. A few things that Target should have done better. The first thing is it turned out they knew it was happening. Like, I mean, when they knew it was happening, they're one of the few US retailers that actually have their own in-house security team. That in-house security team based in Bangalore spotted the malware being installed. It alerted people. It said, hello, malware. And then it spotted the information being exfiltrated out of target system. They go, uh, uh, they're taking all information, go e bye bye, the credit cards. No one listened. They had the software. They saw the problem. They raised the alerts internally and they were completely and utterly ignored. That's not good response, right? <laughs> That's the opposite of good response. The CEO stepped down over this. This only came to light publicly because I think it was raised in Congress. That, like, they hadn't, there's actually no public, uh, I, I actually have a belief that they, there should be laws that mandate that organizations let you know when your information has been breached. Surprisingly, they don't have to. Um, the software they use called FireEye went through the, like just, it is selling gangbusters now because it actually picked this problem up. The issue was that the security team were not properly plugged into the organization. No one listened to them. Their information and their advice was ignored and a CEO lost their job over it. I would really strongly suggest reading um, this blog, uh, Brian Krebs, Krebs on Security blog, it's really accessible, very well written. He um, talked, he actually helped explain a lot of what's happening. He actually spoke to some of the, ha you know, he spoke to some of the hackers. He actually goes and tells you how much a, a stolen credit card is worth. Um, turns out Home Depot has exactly the same, had exactly the same problem as Target did. So that's bad response. Not only did you know something was happening, you did nothing with that information. They also didn't talk to their customers properly. They didn't get out with clear messages about what was and wasn't happening in their systems. That is terrible response. That's how you lose trust. Because they had no ability. If you're an organization that isn't even listening to your security team, you don't even know what to say. They were shamed 
into telling people what happened. Let's think of another organization that was maybe shamed into telling people that a bad thing had happened. Anyone heard of this company? Right? Another example, whatever else happened around, whatever else you might think about this website, this is another classic example of an organization that handled the comms badly. They said, oh no, they don't have the data. Okay, they have the data, but they can't read it. Uh, okay, they have the data and they can read it, but it's not the real data. And it was, and they just lied and they lied. And they just, this was a PR disaster. Think about your response. When something bad happens, get out in front, be clear, explain what's happening. You have to keep people's trust on site. This isn't microservice specific, this is the soft people at the end of the spectrum. Now let's talk about recovery. You've got out there, maybe you've done the right thing, which is, you know, listen to people. How do you recover when a problem has happened? You've identified that you've had some sort of defect, some sort of issue has happened. You think you've been exploited. And sometimes just a suspicion is enough. What are the sorts of things you're going to need to think about in terms of how to recover from this problem? Um, backups can be good. You know, have you got backups of your data? Some of these exploits will be things like CryptoLocker um, things where people will come into your systems, encrypt all of your data, and say, pay me $1 million if you want your data back. That happens not to actually individual people. People's like, you know, don't want to get your phone call from your grandmother to find out all of their files have been encrypted in crypto locker. If you've got backups, you don't care. You wipe the whole thing out, you, you get that stuff back. Having a good policy about backups, making sure they work. Now, that's kind of interesting. In a microservice or organization, we think about people owning services, owning teams. You know, teams owning their services. We need to actually maybe think about what your backup process is. Is it tested? Is it automated? If you have that stuff, and if you have the ability to burn your systems down and recreate things from scratch, that's great. In a world in which the cost of recreating a setup is high, we're more likely, when we think there may have been a problem, to be really, really sure there was a problem before we do anything about it because the cost of rebuilding things is so high. If you can automate the creation of your service infrastructure and you can automate backing up of all your stuff, there's a suspicion we're going to turn the whole thing down. So organizations that have practice immutable infrastructure, say Phoenix servers, for example, where they never allow a service to even be changed, not only can you close off um, a potential attack vectors, but you're tearing this stuff so down so quickly that you know, a lot of rootkit stuff is just going to get blown away. Um, and again, when you're thinking from a recovery point of view, comms are essential. So we need to think about this stuff more holistically. Microservices give us lots of options around prevention. And that's one area which is going to be different for you. You can potentially drastically increase your surface area of problems. There are unsolved problems, as in there are solutions, but I don't like them, around things like uh, you know, the, the confused deputy problem. I think we're getting a bit better at having some lighter weight API gateways, things like API keys. But when you're thinking about security of any system, don't put all your eggs in this basket. At least have some thought and some understanding about what are you going to do when the bad stuff happens. And a lot of the good practices that we use from a point of view of automation can help us in this world of, of recovery as well. I, one last thought is when I think about sort of what's happening with application security now, it's like DevOps, it's a bit of a cultural thing. We're having to change our definition of what it's acceptable for a developer to know around test, you know, around security, like we have with testing and like we had with, say, operations and before. With Agile and DevOps, these were primarily cultural things. There were people, there were soft people changes to our industry. They weren't really tools and technology driven. AppSec and being more savvy around privacy and security of our systems, it definitely is as well. It's a people-based thing. One of the big challenges we have, though, is a lot of the software in this space really sucks. So I do think there is a tools part to this as well. I'm hoping some of you might come up with some solutions for me in this space. So I just want to finish up by saying when we're thinking around security, you know, think prevention, detection, response, recovery. Think about your surface area of attack. Think rationally about where your problems really lie. Um, understand 
where you need to apply protections and where you don't. Um, but uh, thank you for your time. Um, we've got some time for questions. Is there any questions? Any questions? Must be one. One question. A hard question, an easy question. Okay. Um, if any of you do have any questions that you want to ask later, I'm on Twitter or you can email me. Oh, it's a question. Um, yeah, go on. You were just talking about Docker. And Hi. You Hi. were just talking about Docker and then I was wondering, so what, what is the use case that you see or that you use or that you people that you appreciate use Docker to? If, if not for production, how do you uh, use it into developing quickly and into your development? So, so I'm still happy to use Docker in production. I just don't like using it to run other people's code that I don't trust. Um, so I'm not, you know, if I want to run well-known services or systems, like I want to run memcached on a Docker node, <coughs> I'm more likely to roll my own than just pull one from Docker Hub. So for me, the big issue is just that implicit trust model around Docker. Um, I think if you really want a container-based model for execution of arbitrary code, there are safer models out there than Docker. Um, OpenVZ is one that gives you a little bit more security around that stuff. Um, but if you're really in the business of running arbitrary, untrusted code, then you're really looking at type 2 virtualizations like Zen and KVM. Um, or you know, separate physical hardware, to be honest with you. So I think it's more that particular case around the security. I do think they need to have a better solution than they currently have around that stuff, to be honest with you, especially for the, the official images on Docker Hub. Uh, any other questions? Oh, we've got three. This is excellent. Um, you were talking about uh, adding the security tests in a, in the, into the build pipeline. Do you have some examples on, on how to create these uh, attack vectors in an automated way to <coughs> add it to your build pipeline? I mean, there's some basic low-level stuff you can do. Some of the static analysis tools will pick up to, um, coding errors that are often security-related. There's some stuff like... I forget the name, it's like a Ruby static analysis tool that will do some low-level stuff. Um, there's also things like the OWASP Z attack proxy. ZAP, it's called ZAP, which stands for Z attack proxy. It's one of those recursive, annoying acronym things. And that will try and you can run that on your actual system and it will look for common problems like cross-site scripting attack vectors. Those tools are starting to get better. Um, we've used um, um, Zap on a few of our projects just as a way of having that baked into the build pipeline running over and over again, you know. So I think there's a lot of scope for those tools to be better than they are. Um, but that's a good one to look at. So I can't remember. If you go to the ThoughtWorks Tech Radar, we covered a couple of other automatable security tools in the last issue. So you can see it online. But there was definitely a Ruby one I can't remember the name of. Someone will tell me later. Cool. I think we had a couple of other questions. Um, in a microservice architecture, isn't it much more difficult um, to respect security? Because in a monolithic way, in a monolithic architecture, you can have your central filters, your central firewall settings. If you do it more modularized, you have to take care of it on every module, ev every microservice. Is this I, much I, more I think there's, 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 there's two sides to that. On the one hand, you've got one place to look. So you've got one place to look for bad configuration of your firewall. On the other hand, if someone does get in, you're totally screwed. Um, and so you sort of have to almost, it becomes like a, you know, if you've got a giant box and you've got a very, very secure thing in there and you've got loads of stuff you don't really care about as much, you sort of have to treat everything in the same way. So on the one hand, yes, it's simpler. From a network point of view, it's absolutely simpler from that point of view. What you do, though, is you deny yourself any ability to do things like defense in depth. If I think about, say, how I'd build a microservice architecture on, say, a platform like Amazon, where I've got the ability to automate networking, I would actually run different classes of services in different um, VPCs. So effectively, I've got subnets with certain classification of services. I've got, a, so I effectively identify multiple perimeters where I can apply multiple different protections. It uh, implies a level of sophistication with that sophistication, it will become a more secure system. 
I so I, I think it's you've got the potential for it to be both a lot better and a lot worse, depending on the kind of organization you are. Unfortunately, it turns out microservices are just really complicated. Uh, we've got a question here, and then we'll do one at the back then. Yeah, um, HTTPS everywhere. Um, have you, do you have any experience with running your own certification authority in your build server and automate everything? So a couple of my clients have done that. I haven't done that myself, um, and that has been has been seen to work. And I think um, the issue is all that every organization then handles the automation around that slightly differently. I, what I would really like is with now that Let's Encrypt have defined this ACME protocol, whether or not that now becomes a much lighter way protocol internally. Certainly some of my clients have absolutely done that. Um, it's not something I've had hands-on experience doing. It's just, yeah, it's, it's doable. It's doable. It tends to be like, you tend to have to have like people dedicated to doing that. So it tends to be something an organization will do at scale. I don't see a 10-person team carving out enough bandwidth to necessarily run their own certificate signing authority. Um, but yeah, it, it, that is a potential solution for some of that, absolutely. Would you, Question. Would you use uh, honeypots um, in a medium or big size organization? And Used um, honeypots. Uh, and I make fake calls or? Yeah, I, I've, I, I used to run a honeypot at home for fun, but I never really looked at it. Um, <laughs> Like, so it's just like, you know, uh, it's like, oh, I've got it. I ran, I used to run Snort. I never, yeah, I, um, I've not seen experience of doing that. Um, I think a slight variation on, on the honeypot is, is, is actually using bug bounties. So um, rather than having places where you attract people and sort of divert them off and... An internal honeypot where you actually make fake calls and probably monitor this thing. So you, uh, are, you, you sort of are you talking here around like sort of semantic monitoring where I like make f I fake I internal know. attacks? Yeah, I mean, I'd argue you can do that. You know, I think um, like on our own systems, we have an external organization that does a lot of this stuff. We run Nisus Pro on our own internal systems. We run port scans. We have to let people know it's happening because otherwise people freak out. But like one of my internal systems, if you just request a page like once every second, the whole system falls down after a while. That's just a port scan. That's not even a denial of service attack. That's not a distributed denial of service attack. That's a really lazy denial of service attack. We just did a port scan and our systems fell over. Um, so yeah, we're trying to get better at that stuff. It's really embarrassing. Um, so yeah, I think there's, so I think a lot of those tools, and like Nisus is not that hard to run as an example. It's hard to interpret, which is one of the problems. Um, so uh, yeah, I was thinking, because I was thinking the old school version of Honeypots, which was where you create networks where you want people to attack them and divert them off. Is, anyone, anyone here plays Netrunner? Yeah, that's like some I no no one plays Netrunner here. Okay, it's just me. Um, but yeah, so that's the old school idea. But yeah, so I don't. I don't. Um, any other questions? Cool. I think we're done. I'm going to be around for maybe the next sort of 10, 15 minutes or so if you want to grab me. But if not, no, I'm not, not dying. I'm just I'm sort of going to go home at some point. You can email me. Um, if you ask me questions on Twitter, I'll do my best to answer them, and then I can answer them publicly for people too. Um, but thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Sam.